Hello and welcome to the F1 Fever Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and this week it's been a busy one. For the first time ever, Formula One was supported by F2, F3 and W Series all on the same weekend. It wasn't the most scintillating of Saturdays in Barcelona, but it got a little bit more hectic on Sunday. And here to help me unpack it and to hear about their seasons are two junior racing drivers plus a familiar face from F1 Feeder Series. First, let me introduce a driver who will be racing around Monaco in a few days. Freca driver, Mary Boyer, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? Yeah, hello, thank you. Uh, I'm quite excited to be, to be here. Yeah, excited to have you. Mary, you were in Barcelona on the weekend, weren't you? Yeah, I, I was there since Saturday right there, and then I see both Saturday and Sunday races. All getting prepared to drive very soon in Formula 3, I would imagine. That's the plan. And joining Mary is a man who will soon be having all the Brazilian vamos messages that we saw on social media for Drogovic this weekend, instead getting sent his way. It's GB3 driver racing for Carlin, Roberto Faria. Bom dia, Roberto. How are you? Bom dia. I'm quite good. Uh, I hope to have a nice talk with you. And yeah, quite excited for this race week. Yeah, it's going to be good. You're racing, of course, this weekend as well. Not around the streets of, uh, of Monaco, but a bit more of a traditional racing track. But we'll get onto that in a little bit. And finally, despite some people believing he's a frog, I can confirm he's actually just a promising motorsport journalist and only a part-time amphibian. It's Charlie Parker back on the podcast. Welcome back, Charlie. How are you? I took a strike because they kept calling me a frog and now I'm back and they're still calling me a frog. I can't get away from this. Hello, <laughs> everyone. Good to have you, Charlie. Did you enjoy this weekend's racing action? Uh, I mean, it's Barcelona, so my expectations were very low and it was all right so i suppose it beat my expectations yeah i feel a bit of the same actually so uh, barcelona's never one to get too excited about but actually some of the racing was pretty damn good so well done barcelona for not disappointing us like we expected that's the best i think i can do but before we get into it a quick reminder to like comment and subscribe if you're watching on youtube and if you're listening to the audio only version please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using it really does help us out. Let's get to Formula 2 because we are in the middle of a double header this week. Just left Barcelona, going into Monaco. The drivers were all back in action in Spain, although we were without Ralph Boschong, but Chen Bolik Bassi made a return. But there's only one place to start. Felipe Drogovic won both the sprint race and the feature race. Pretty good weekend for Brazil then, Roberto. Yes, uh, Drogovic, everybody likes him in Brazil, and I'm supporting him a lot. Uh, last year, I met him and I watched his race from Silverstone. Uh, he didn't adapt quite to the car last year with the team, and it's nice to see him doing really well this year with uh, MP again. And I hope him to do really well in the championship. Yeah, I feel that no one was when I was when we spoke about the season at the start everyone had like a lot of respect for Drogovic but I don't think anybody expected him to be leading the championship he's doing so well now looking at the standings he's in P1 26 points ahead of Porsche in P2 and 11 points now separate the next eight drivers who are all 19 points behind Porsche so Charlie is it a two-horse race already uh I think it's a bit too early to say that there's still 10 weekends left, but it's hard to bet against a guy who's really good in an orange MP mm. <laughs> for some reason. Just an orange MP, nothing else. It's just orange MP, love it, win races. But I think Yuri Vips has been unlucky. Some mistakes he's made on track and some issues with his car. It was both. He had both of that this weekend. He had an issue he, he spun out himself and then an issue with his car, issue with his brakes on the Sunday. I don't trust uh, Jehan Daruvula to really pull through, and he's in third at the moment. I think Liam Lawson could come back in it later on in the season, but Porsche and Drogovic, definitely the ones to look out for this season. Well, speaking of Porsche, we've got a driver who might have been uh, enjoying the weekend, if not for Drogovic's dominance, and Porsche, of course, never made it. To the podium, which I was going to say it's the first time this season, but he had a dreadful round in Jeddah as well. 
Porsche is still in the championship hunt, Mary. How did you find this weekend in Formula 2? Well, uh, for sure, uh, Drovic has a uh, plus. Not only him, also his teammate. They were really strong in there. Mm. But also, I will say my team, IRT, were quite comp- uh, competitive. Not, not only with uh, Porsche, also with Bestie this weekend. Uh, him, he make a really high jump and go to the podium on the future race on Sunday. So looks really good. And I think Pucher in Monaco last year did a really good job. So I think he will be fighting for the top positions, no, no doubt. And the championship is still too long. So yeah, I think it's in the right direction and it's looking really good for him. It really is. Uh, Drogovic, however, is now scored points in every single round and every single race so far. Eight races, three wins four podiums, points every time. It's quite the... We say consistency is key all the time, Charlie. Is that sort of consistency going to win in a championship? A consistency will win you the championship. You have to be there or be there about in every single race to win in the feeder series. So, yeah, if he keeps this up every round, he's going to win the championship. Well, simple question, simple answer, I guess. Yeah, if he keeps doing that. But I do want to actually bring that up because, Mary, you reminded me Previous guest, Fred Vesti, joined us and he seemed to turn a corner. Was there anything specific this weekend why he seemed to have jumped up? Or do you think he's just got himself finally a bit more familiar with the car? Because that podium didn't look like it might be something he'd pull out at the start of the season, but he looked very comfortable in Barcelona. Yeah, for me, it surprised me quite a lot because normally he was quite, not far, but a bit behind Pulcher. And this weekend he was able even to to be quite in front of him. So I think this is giving him a lot of confidence and let's see if he can maintain like this for the rest of the season because it's still too long and he could still do really good. Well, he got points last time out because he got the sixth place at Imola. Do you think that's the sort of thing that might have given him a bit more encouragement that he'll do well this season? Just needed to get the first points on the board? Yeah, for sure. Also, having the first podium in Barcelona will give him an extra boost. That for sure, uh, at least for Monaco, he will be really motivated. And, and for sure, if the car is working well, he will do a, a good job. Indeed. Well, good to see him jump into the, well, not say the title fight at this point, but jump into the points. So it's going to tighten things up. Just looking where he's in the championship, 13th of 25 points, but only 12 points behind Liam Lawson in fourth. So it just shows you how tight all of that is. The weather this weekend, scorching. Like, well, In fact, you were there, Mary. How hot was it? Because I was looking at some of the data from Pirelli. It said it was like a 51 or 52 degrees track temperature. Was it as hot as that? Did it feel hot? Yeah, Barcelona, Barcelona since the last week, I will say it's amazing uh, how hot it is. It's like, it's impossible to be outside. Really drinking a lot of water. I can't imagine how it will be racing in these temperatures. Uh, I, we will go with our championship on October, so I think it will be much better because if not, it was super, super hot. It was amazing. Yeah, amazing maybe as a tourist, maybe not so much as uh, somebody sitting inside a cockpit, although that nice draft, <laughs> that breeze will come through when you're going 150 miles an hour down the main straight. Yeah. But the weather was pretty much the opposite of last time out at Imola, which you were able to experience, not on the same weekend, but with the dreadful weather conditions in Italy when you were racing there. How much does that high tyre temperature affect the tyres when you're racing around the track? Does degradation just really start hitting hard? Well, uh, not only that, also Barcelona is one of the most uh, aggressive uh, tracks for the for the tyres, and also if the temperature is higher, so this is... Uh, giving even more, more, more degradation. And if we compare to Imola, Imola, I will say, is one of the smooth tracks uh, for the tire deck. And if the temperature is slow, it's even less. So I think adapting for the teams has been a, a difficult situation. And also uh, for that, I will say maybe there was some big difference between the teams on especially the future race when the race are long and the deck is so high then the teams are making some difference in there so yeah one thing i would ask you roberto regards to barcelona everyone talks about how familiar everybody is when you're there because it's a track that people go to so much and when you're racing as you are right now in the uk there's only we've got a lot of tracks in the uk but 
there's only so many, so you're very familiar with them. How much does that help you when you return to a track? And do you think it's not actually as much of an advantage as people think because most of the other drivers know the track so well? I think uh, racing in your case have the advantage disadvantage. I think the weather in your case is quite tricky. So you learn to drive in a lot of different conditions. Like sometimes it's raining, sometimes it's sunny, and then it starts to rain in the middle of the race. And then sometimes it's raining, they stop ra- stop the rain from nowhere and then you just look at the weather conditions and you just know, don't know what is going to happen tomorrow so i think that's a good part in racing here in uk but i think it's also really important to learn the tracks in europe so yeah at the end of the year we go and do some tests around catalonia and barcelona or valencia with the car uh, during the winter but yeah i would say it's very important to when you go to the track for the second time, you probably can maximize it way better than your know, first time. A lot more familiar. And that's Roberto's message. To, he's going to be a prime minister soon, having that sort of political answer saying the weather is tricky. The weather is bad in the UK. You could say it. We, we know it's bad in the UK. You've got people from Brazil and Spain here. You guys must love the weather. And then you come to the UK. It's dreadful. <laughs> We need to get on to F3 because it wasn't just Formula 2 racing this weekend. It was a weekend of two halves for Victor Martin. DNF in the sprint race after a mechanical failure, and he was running in the points at that point. But he glided to the feature race win on Sunday. How highly do ART rate Victor, Mary? I mean, for sure, he have a lot of experience uh, on single-seaters. Uh, he, he did three years on Formula Regional, and he and the last year winning uh, with ART with a really, really strong uh, year for him. And then uh, he jumps to the free. He did, he did a really strong year, I will say, for being a rookie. And for sure now he's coming back to ART. He knows everyone from there. and He had experience with the car for sure at the beginning of the season already with no going to the test. I knew he will be one of the guys to to be the title contender and now he is for sure showing his potential and every week uh, every weekend uh, he's on the podium or at least fighting for the for the win and etc so for sure uh, he's a really good uh, driver and with a lot of experience that it's it's giving him a lot of uh, like uh, confidence and it's yeah yeah, I imagine when you're in three rounds into the season and you've got two winners' trophies and one runner-up trophy, that is the confidence that you need. But there were a few other names that surprised me, and I'm going to highlight that's me rather than everybody, but I think that's because I've been looking at the championship so far and I was thinking Martins versus Leclerc, but David Vidalis took a home win for both him and Campos, and then Jack Crawford and Roman Stanek look like they're now in the championship hunt, not to mention Hadjar, who's always been there or thereabouts, He's made it to the podium every round so far. Charlie, am I wrong to be surprised by the performance of these guys? Oh, if you ask David Vidalas, yeah, you're quite wrong. Uh, I asked him after that sprint race if he like this win would change his expectations, but he believes his Campos car is good enough for wins and that the team needs to believe and take that extra step to get podiums and win races. And Stanek... He has to perform this year. It's his third year. It's kind of a do or die for him to move up. And, you know, I think most people expected him to be in that challenge, mainly because he had to be. Crawford, he's he's second year in F3, but this is his 50th single-seater podium he got this weekend. He's been in the US and he's been all over Europe. He's a very experienced driver for how young he is. And I think with Isaac Hajar, people thought he'd be fast. But I don't think anyone would would have thought he was above Leclerc in the standings fast. Hmm. I'm looking at him now. So he's got a four-point gap ahead of Leclerc, who... Well, a tricky feature race, isn't he? And that's where the big points are scored. Uh, just bringing up Crawford, though, actually, because, Roberto, we were talking just before that we started the podcast and of that move from your home. You know, you have to come transatlantic for so many drivers. And it's one of these things that I think a lot of, Europeans might forget how much of a change that is. Crawford's come from pretty good results from the US. Do you think he's had the same sort of thing as you, where he's had to come to Europe, learn tracks, 
familiarize himself with this entire way of living by yourself. And that's something that a lot of drivers don't, or a lot of fans don't give drivers credit for. Yes, it's not quite easy. Uh, I, I don't know if he moved with his family or not. But for example, I, I moved alone without my family. So it's quite tricky to leave all your friends or your family behind and you just need to adapt to a new culture, new language. For me, for, for him, it was the same. But yeah, it's just completely different aspect that people don't think why, like for racing drivers, they need to adapt to a new country. But it's actually a big part of it. Uh, I think also he needs to adapt to the team and he his his English is probably really good because he's, he's <laughs> you, you'd hope so right <laughs> yeah but my English was not good when I came here so I improved a lot since then and yeah I think it's a really important part as a in in your career to adapt to a new culture and new, new country well somebody who's English is fluent, but I'm currently not living in England and the language is beyond me. I'm always amazed, in fact, both of you, Roberto and Mary, how well you speak English. So good on you for that. And let's uh, let's just knock Jack Crawford down a few pegs because he didn't have to do that. So it was easier for him than, uh, than Roberto, right? So, but there's um, not the only story in town. What else have I overlooked, Charlie? Because it was a busy, frantic, well, feature race in particular, but as usual, a busy, frantic weekend in Formula 3. Well, I would say you've overlooked Zach O'Sullivan, but that's because he's told me to shout him out on the podcast earlier today. <laughs> he wants me to make sure everyone knows that he's a very heroic performer in that Carlin, which I have to admit, the Carlin F3 team, historically not very good. He is, he, when I talked to him before the season started, he had no thoughts of being anywhere near even reverse grid pole, and he got it in the very first race of the season. So even Zach is quite shocked that he's there. But I do want to mention Zach and another story that happened on Twitter. Reese, I was going to say it was the story involved Reese Ushijima who had the first lap ding dong, right? Reese Ushijima was not happy about. He said on Twitter that he left space for someone and they didn't give him space. He didn't mention anyone, but I found out it was Zach Sullivan. And the FIA ha- did have a look at it, just so everyone knows, and they cleared Zach of any wrongdoing. So it's sour grapes from Reese, really. And there's, according to uh, a, form- a current Formula 3 driver, who I will not name, because mm. you will have to join the Discord to find out who it is. That's a plug there, right there. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> no problem. That there is a new directive this season that if you go into a corner and you get to the apex first, that is your corner, no matter how far you've dive bombed from, no matter how f- much you push him off the track, no matter if you T-bone him, it is your corner if you get to the apex first. I don't know if the other two drivers have any opinions on if you get to the apex first, it's your corner. Uh, Roberto, is that something you think is fair? Because it sounds a little bit like dive bombing. I would say it's fair in uh, rental go cards, you know, <laughs> then you just don't care. <laughs> so I think that's the rule in the rental go cards, but I don't think the real life is supposed to be like that. Uh, Mary, if this was an approach you were taking, how many front wings would you lose? Yeah, yeah. in a single seater, it's a bit, I don't think it's the right thing because as soon as you touch, you touch with someone, then the race is normally finished. So I don't think it's a good way to do it. Eh? Well, for the benefit of those listening rather than watching, Charlie was nodding there in somewhat agreement, thinking, I think this is a bit of a silly uh, thing. Tell us more, Charlie. Uh, you'd have to join the Discord to find out, Jim. Mm. Well, I, I am there uh, and also was looking out for Zach O'Sullivan this weekend. I do try and uh, make sure I keep an eye out on uh, previous guests of the podcast. He's not on and it, TV. It wasn't the, <laughs> it wasn't on TV much. I did see Yushijima go off in the final, the final corners, though. But yeah, he, he seemed to just disappear off the timing screens at the end. And I think he had some damage. I don't know if it's from Reese yeah, Yushijima damage. or um, another incident. It was from that Reese Zach incident. It was. Well, that's uh, unfortunate for him. I will also shout out that Colpinto got another decent, well, eighth place, so another couple of points. So doing very, very well. Um, And yet at the moment, I'm looking at the championship and I'm thinking, it's not easy to see who's going to win it, Charlie. Who's your money on at the moment? 
Oh, I don't make F3 predictions. People keep asking me for my F3 predictions. And since I cover F3, I'm like, do you know what? I'm not. Because one weekend, Colapinto could lead the championship in two weekends. And mm. he's eighth in the standings. You could read it like Martins had zero, one win, zero points in the sprint race. He did the same at Bar- Barcelona, zero points in the sprint race and a win in the feature race. You could change a weekend around in one go easily. Yeah, it's all all why we love Formula 3, though. But, well, they'll be back in action in a little while because they're having June off uh, and then back in for Silverstone in the start of July. So we'll come back to them in a little while. We can't have a Frecker driver join the podcast and not talk about Frecker. It's two rounds in, Mary, and you're sitting in P5. How have you found 2022 so far? Well, I think uh, the season is, is going quite well. Uh, we start uh, from last and every time we are getting more confident, not only with the team, also with the car. Uh, it's changing a bit from last year. Uh, and yeah, I'm really confident with the team and every round is looking better and better. So I'm really excited to see how Monaco goes for us. Are you finding that, so you've jumped um, from Van Amersfoort, who are doing brilliantly, um, to the surprise of myself in Formula 3, Formula 2, and you've gone to ART, who have got such a pedigree anyway. How have you found the difference in, in team this year? Well, uh, not only not all the teams have the same philosophy on working with the car, and uh, let's say some teams like uh, some styles on the driving and on the on the on their car and other teams like other things from the driver and from the car and you have to adapt to what they like and then put together the things that a driver like from a car and then the team adapt a bit to the driver and look the look for the maximum performance I will say and this is a thing that uh, race by race or test by test you you understand with the team and you you gain performance, I would say. Are you finding then that this is potentially one of those things that we saw with, or we're seeing with Drogovic and MP, that you might have found a good philosophy for you at the moment with how ART are going so far in, in Freca? I know Prema have been dominant with Dino in particular doing oh so well, but you guys are nipping on their heels. Yeah, I am sure uh, we will uh, be fighting with them. Uh, Dino has had a really strong uh, start of the season. For sure, we start in two Italian tracks that normally the team are quite strong in there. Uh, but now we will see when we came to Europe and see our, uh, let's see, two favorite tracks for the team. And, and let's see how, how everything developed. We only had two rounds. It's difficult to say how it will go everything, but at least on testing and everything, we, we have really good data and really good uh, confidence, I will say, to to continue with the season. Yeah, maybe those Premier boys won't be so fast when they don't have the pizza to power them on their home on their home soil. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going off to Monaco, which is uh, such a historic and iconic event. It's not your first time there, not your first time on the F1 calendar. How is it when you're a support race for Formula One? What's it like racing around Monaco? What's it like supporting F1? Well, uh, first time when you arrive there, it's a really special moment. Eh? You you start to think when you start in karting and you never imagine that you will be there with them. Uh, still, we are quite far from them, but still you, you feel you are in the same place and the same moment. And it's a really special moment, I would say. At least for me, it was really really special yeah uh, but racing in monaco is even more special i will say but racing in monaco together with the f1 is not the best thing because always we have to wake up really 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 early it's amazing how early we, ca- we have to to wake up and then we have all the day uh, to rest and everything but yeah it's the only thing i i don't like but for the rest it's just amazing experience and yeah super special well, I can tell you're going to go very far, Mary, because if you're a racing driver who gets to race around Monaco and you're still finding things that could be better, you're like all the top racing drivers who are never quite happy with the setup. But I have heard that the Frecker paddock and garages are quite far away from the track, right? Yeah, we have the, to drive with the cars to go to the track. 
and then to go to the pit lane and all the members from the team go with a band uh, with all the stuff that they need to if something is broken or something to start the engine and everything and then we, to come back exactly the same we go out uh, at the exit of t8 and we go for in the main straight in the main street from the from Monaco and going to the mm. tennis club that is where all the tent and everything is for us. <laughs> well, I've not been to Monaco yet, but yeah, that does sound like a, a lot of driving and not when you're in the single seater car. So it's going to be a busy weekend for you with some early alarms. We wish you well. Yeah. We've got a lot of questions to go through from the audience. So I would love to talk Freca more, but maybe we'll get you back in the future, Mary. We've got GB3 to talk about as well, with Roberto joining us. Now, you were there, Roberto, last year when it's still called British F3, and you finished fifth. Currently, you're sitting third in the championship. What are your thoughts on having a shot at the title this year? Yeah, uh, the first round I finished in second, quite close to the first. Now in the second round in Silverstone, we weren't so good. We quite didn't find the pace. Uh, the cars are new for this year, so the team is still finding the pace and we are working together to maximize it for this week. And yeah, uh, we are really close. Uh, the level is quite high right now. It's really close. The gap, uh, there is three different teams with the three uh, top drivers. So it's not just one team fighting. And yeah, it's, this year is, is, I'm fighting for the win. I want to be champion and I hope to win more races. Well, is one of those races going to, one of those wins in races going to be coming this weekend? It's Donington Park. Is this a track that you're a fan of? How do you think you're going to fare this weekend? I would say we as a team in Carly, we are faster in short tracks uh, right now. Uh, we need to test more the car. I mean, for example, in Autumn Park, we were quite good and we had an official test day in Brands Hatch, which was the fastest. But right now, in long tracks like Silverstone and Donington, we were not as fast as we should be. So I hope to find some pace uh, this week and, and try to win both races. And yeah. So I'm looking at the, your calendar. So after this Snetterton Spa, a lovely short track, Silverstone, Brands Hatch, Donington Park again. Um, the Brands Hatch one, is that racing on the Indy circuit or the Grand Prix circuit? It's the Grand Prix circuit. Oh, so you've got some, you've got some longer tracks to, to race at. Uh, you got, was it a win at Spa last year that you took as well? Yes, uh, last year in Spa, uh, I won the last race. So, so you really just don't like winning on British soil. You have to go overseas to do it. So that might be a problem when you're racing in GB3. Go the wrong championship. <laughs> yeah. I would say that I quite like the Spa track. Everybody does. Spa's a, Spa's a terrific one. But yeah, let's talk about something else, which is big news. So you've joined the Sauber Academy, and we can see, for the benefit of everybody who's listening and not watching on YouTube, Sauber Academy proudly blazoned on your chest there as you went in your polo shirt you've met Theo Pochere earlier in the year how different is it now you're part of the academy and with how high did the the team look at Theo how does that make you feel how they must look at you yes yeah, uh Sauber Academy just have uh in the Formula team just had two drivers this year so me and Theo is quite nice to have all the support from them and this year at the beginning of the year I went to Swiss with Theo and we did some gym together and uh, learned uh, how to improve the physical but yeah the expectation is really high for this year and hope to continue with them for a long time. Well I hope that too um, Porsche is obviously so highly rated and we were speaking to Lawrence Barreto last week the F1 reporter who knows Fred Resource so well and he just says that they want him to be in the car this year if he had his way so I think you're probably 
been quite modest in what how highly they must view you to join the academy so big congratulations for you have you had any discussions about what might be next for next year if you were to win the championship this year are you looking at freca or f3 is that too much of a jump yeah uh if i win the championship this year uh we are probably looking to fif3 don't Ooh. be just uh i did one test day uh last year and in Valencia, just one official day, and I quite like the car. But yeah, Tio Porsche, he's an amazing driver, and the team is, likes him. I can see that. And last year he did some tests with uh Alfa Romeo in their car, in their phone car, and so the team actually really like him. I think. I'm going to move on a little bit because I've got loads of questions to go through. Um, so we could ask the questions all day, but F1 PT Series isn't for us. It's for our audience, and we want to make sure that you all feel involved. So we're going to go on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. The first question wasn't actually asked by uh, Ask F1FS. It was actually sent to my uh, DMs by a certain Chris McCarthy, the Frecker commentator, who wanted to ask uh, Mary, how did you find Push to Pass in the first race of the season? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know why why she say that because uh, well, at the first race of the season it was uh, in Monza and it was raining, and it, there were many safety cars and red well not red flags but many many uh, safety car and safety car restart no for sure, and uh, I didn't have uh, fully clear when I could use the push to pass and when you had a safety car restart immediately when you pass the finish line you could use it and i was having really good exit from the last corner and being side by side even passing the guy uh, after the finish line and at some point i was losing a speed and i didn't know why and i say for sure they are, they are using the push to pass but we are not allowed we have to wait one lap to put it and i was not true with that and yeah i i lost some opportunities and some position gains because of this i didn't use any I use only one push to pass, and for sure that race would, would have been a bit better for us because the pace in the rain in there was mega, like really, really good. Well, I'm going to go on to uh, onto the standings and just adjust your, was it seventh and sixth? I'm going to just put first and first to make the championship right because of your not using the, the push to pass properly. <laughs> no. um, the next question comes from uh, Ailes or Ales. I don't know how I'm pronouncing that, but Balb F1 on Twitter. Who are your references? And I don't know what it means by that, or they mean by that, but what do you want to do next year is the other part of their question. Let's, let's focus on that. This is for you, Mary. So what do you want to do next year? Is it simple as get promoted into FIA F3? Yeah, I will say is the the right step to do to, to go higher. Uh, I think I'm in a really, really good team. Uh, they have a really good also material I'll say for FIA F3 and also to continue, but this is uh, a bit longer. And for sure, make the jump to the FIA F3 will be amazing. But first, we we have to be focused on this year because still uh, eight rounds to go. And yeah, uh, first they want to try to win the championship. For sure, there there are a lot of drivers and and teams that they are really fighting for it and a lot of level, but. The main objective is this, and then we will see what what uh, what the future uh, gives to us. I would say. Yeah. Now, I've been um, spoke with your teammate uh, Gabriel Mini recently, who had an equally mature answer. So, whatever is going on at ART, they are giving your uh, press answers completely the right way around to make sure it's all focused on this year. Figure out the future later. There's a question here from G Company via Instagram, and I'm going to ask this one to you because it wasn't specified, but let's go with you, Roberto, and it may be changed now because of your situation. Do you <laughs> count the spot? I say your situation because of Sauber, but do you count sponsors and financial backup to move later to bigger categories, or do you find sponsors year by year? So I think what they're asking are 
do you find your sponsors and say, you're going to come on a journey with me on my way to F1? Or do you look for new sponsors year by year? I think it really depends case to case. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, right now, I just have the support of the Sauber Academy. And I have a sponsor from Brazil, but they are supporting me since I started. So I would say that if the sponsors uh, really want to support you, they just support you during some years if you keep bringing the results, I think. So at the moment, because I don't understand this, and this is something that most of us fans, maybe Charlie, maybe you know, I don't know, but I don't know how this sponsor stuff works, right? You got to go and say to somebody, come on my journey, I want to make it to Formula One, and if you join me now, it'll, it'll be good. Like, Are you trying to promote yourself as somebody who will get a bit of screen time on British television, which must be difficult for you as a Brazilian when you want to get sponsors. Are you trying to find somebody to say, sponsor me now and you'll have a sticker on the car or on my helmet should I reach Formula One? Yes, I think uh, it's quite tricky because now we don't, it's quite expensive sport. So to have a sponsor is quite expensive to sponsor a racing driver. But I think if the company really trusts that you're going to do well, maybe the company wants to create a relationship with you since you are a junior and then they can promote this during the years. And then when you're F1 driver, they just uh, continue showing that, oh, we were with the driver since the beginning. And I think that's a good part of the sponsors. And mainly the sponsors is probably from your home country mm. and companies that really want to support the motorsport. But it's quite really tricky to find good sponsors, I think. Yeah, I'm not jealous. Some of the stories I've heard, you know, like with George Russell and his uh, famous PowerPoint presentations, all this sort of stuff to try and get a seat at uh, Williams and how you have to go about yourself. I spoke to Pierre-Louis Chauvet saying he's going to as a teenager to go and get sponsors himself. I can't get sponsors, I'm twice your age. Let's move on to a question here from Nono. What is your target just to drive the best car you can or do you have a final goal? Let's go with you on this one first, Mary. I think that, I think, and maybe I'm misinterpreting, they're talking about your ultimate target. Is it just as simple as be F1 champion? For sure. Uh... I will not say it's the same target for everyone, but for sure for the majority of the guys who are racing in single seaters is to achieve the goal that is to arrive to to the F1. Uh, it's still a long uh, way, but uh, shorter and shorter. But it's it's also true that every step now it's uh, more difficult and more difficult, and the places uh, are getting also more limited. So it's really important now to to really maximize uh, our potential to to, you know, to get known to the world and, and to have a, one of those limited seats. Is it the same on your side as well, and Roberto? Your goal is just to be eight-time world champion better than Lewis Hamilton? I think uh, being world champion in Formula 1 is the top of the sport, so you cannot really have a goal more than that. So I think, yeah, my goal is BF1 champion, but as Mari said, he is still quite far uh, away. And now we need to work and try to go to F1 first and then just keep uh, increasing the goals. I mean, like this year, my goal is to be champion of GB3 and then just increase the goal each year by year, I would say. It's not a question for you, Charlie, but what's, what's your goal? You're, are you going to be Formula One world champion or are you just aiming to be the best journalist in the world? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a high goal. No, I think, I think, Charlie, I've read some of your work. Don't get too embarrassed, but it, but it was pretty damn good. Pretty damn good. And people can look at f1feederseries.com to read some of that stuff. In fact, Charlie, because there's a lot of feeder series out there and it's difficult for me to keep on top of them. I've read your work just to make sure I've got the right research before going into one of these podcasts, even if you're not there. So you're always there in spirit. Storytime with Charlie Parker is always there with me. We've got a question here, which I do want to ask because it's 
asked via YouTube, and I say it every week, but all the questions go via Twitter, via Discord, via Instagram. But this is the first proper YouTube question from Yusef Remy. So thank you so much for asking. And you asked it two weeks ago, and it was, I have a question for any drivers on the Future Podcast. And we just had broadcasters last week. So this is my first opportunity to ask it. This, I'm going to go to you, Roberto, for this. They have a question asking, what are your thoughts on Joshua Pearson, who at a very young age seems to be embarking on sports car career instead of doing some open wheel feeder series? Now, I wasn't sure who Joshua Pearson was, so a little bit of Googling. Turns out he's the youngest driver to, or will be the youngest driver, to compete in the 24-hour of Le Mans because his tender years means he's only 16. It's not a conventional route because racing with a roof over your head always seems to be what people do when they haven't made it to F1 because of finances, because of lack of opportunity and so on, was racing with, especially with Brazilian Connection, stock car, was racing with um, sports cars ever something you considered? I think uh, the big manufacturers, uh, there are more professional racing drivers driving touring cars than in Formula One. So the market for the drivers are better in GT, the GT world. So... I would say if he really enjoys and he decided to do that since the beginning, then I see as he cl clearly knows what he wants to do for his career. And in Brazil, it's very common to the karting drivers go to uh, the series for stock car in Brazil. Hmm. So you have a uh, stock light and one below that is sprint race. And I have many friends that are in stock light. Some of them are already in stock car. And... Yeah, I think the GT world has a lot of opportunities and some drivers just decide to go for it since the beginning. So I think it's quite a smart way to be a professional driver. Yeah, it's a way to get a bit of money as a professional driver as well in a world where money is a problem, as I'm sure you two both know how you're trying to, where you're trying to go with the expenses to get into F2. Um, this question comes from Moritz Teng. Moritz Tenge. Apologies on the pronunciation, Moritz. This one's for you, Mary. In the Spanish F4 season in 2020, you were a clear second behind Cass Haverfort. Now you seem to be on par or even better. Where does the upswing come from? Does the Freca car fit you better or have you personally evolved so much? Well, uh... he says with a big smile on his face, may I point out when he starts. <laughs> well, it's a question that many people uh, ask to me. Why? Because... For sure, Cass, on my first year on the single seaters, he was a step in front of me, uh, more consistent, and for sure, he had, I would say, more speed than me. But it's true that when I started my first year on single seaters, I didn't have uh, really a lot of uh, laps on a single seater, and it was uh, little by little, no, adapting, adapting, and yeah, also with the COVID-19, uh, I couldn't exit from Spain. As a family, we decided to stay in home and uh, our teammates like Cass or, or Josh Dufek uh, were testing on Holland uh, quite a lot. And already in the last testings before this, I was quite close to him, but and then stopping and it was not uh, easy for me to restart. But at least taking P2 was really good. And then for my first year in Freca, I think uh, I I make a really good jump, uh, I will say, as a driver. Uh, because not having uh, a lot of reference with this car, also on the tracks, it was, mainly, I will say, nearly in all the tracks the first time for me. And not only for me, also for the team. It was also quite difficult because they never have been with that car and also finding setups and this. We had to work really fast and really clear what we wanted to try. And this helped me a lot to to progress to pro progress as a driver and to maximize all the time on the track and be really really good. I will say on the debrief of the car and ask the right things and really precise. And I think this year I, I learned a lot of things and I think this year I I can apply these things to to the new car with ART. Yeah, well, it's going pretty well so far. I'm pretty sure you're going to be uh, there or thereabouts right at the end. So doing really, really well. There's another question about the Sauber setup as well here for you, Roberto. 
AS19, Alex. This is where Charlie, I think, shakes his head. There we go, straight away. Wants to know what expectations have Sauber set to remain in the program next year? Do you get expectations? Is that something they say? If you want to stay with us, you need to do this. I know Helmut Marko has quite a difficult uh, approach with this. Yeah. Uh, in the Sauber Academy, uh, I have the contract for a long time, but we have objectives and I need to achieve them to, uh, for example, they help me more uh, with financial if I achieve uh, better objectives. Hmm. So, and we also want to win as a team. And then depends. Uh, yeah, I think I need to achieve the objects so we can continue together and they can help me even more. So are they looking at that from the way you say that as we're going to support you, but we'll support you even more if you finish third, second, first, that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say it's like that. Okay, well, play, keeping your cards close to your chest there, I understand that. The contracts are difficult to talk about, but I think I got enough out of that. And hopefully, Alex, you're satisfied with that. There's another question about that, just the final one with uh, the Cyber stuff, that Tom Evans Photography via Discord wants to know, how has being in Cyber Academy affected your hopes of getting to F1? Do you feel from this time last year to this year that it's a lot more of a clear pathway? Yeah, I would say that they helped me a lot. Uh, I could talk uh, with uh, them and they are like an F1 team. I've never been an F1 team inside before. So actually just makes you think like, how am I here? Like I was just, as Mario said as well, I was like driving go-karts until yesterday and now I'm in this F1 team and it's just like crazy. But yeah, it increased the hopes. But still, we have. I have to focus on now on this year, and if I ever feel well, we keep together until that one. Terrific! I'm going to just point out because Mary and Roberto said before we started recording the podcast that going for exams at the moment, everybody, people who are you know, watching and listening, do you think of the racing cars? Because racing cars around Donington and Monaco this weekend go around go-karts but they're also just done exams so you guys are juggling so much so congratulations for how you're doing so hopefully it all works out but yeah stay in school but not for too long get to get to formula one first that's much better there's a couple more questions this one's specifically for you mary as19 enjoyer via discord <laughs> charlie creasing himself on this Weird name. Uh, what is your favorite track that you've raced on? And hi from Italy. And thank you for the autograph. Okay. Uh, I will say my favorite track is not uh, on our calendar uh, this year. It was Jerez. Uh, mm. I discovered this track in the Formula 4. Um, wow, for me, it's amazing. Not only the track, also... The place, uh, I really like it. Like, first time I was there, first lap, I was just really enjoying it. It's true that if you ask to me one track that I don't like, I don't know now what to say to you because I'm enjoying in all the tracks. Like, I really like them. All the tracks from this championship have different things, but I really like them all. Um, yeah. Maybe a spa, it's from the, our championship, the one that I like the most for sure. Monaco, I will say, is the most special one, but we will see also Hungary that I have never been in there. So we will see how, how is that one. People speak to me really good, so we will see how it's in real life. I was very surprised there, uh, Mary, that you were just going to voluntarily say this is my least favourite track, which isn't something I expected to get out of a driver because of, I don't know what sort of issues that might be when you visit there in the future. But Jerez is a great track. Let's move on to the final question. This is from JV Monaghan via Instagram, who wants to know, both of you, what is your favourite movie in the Spanish and slash or Portuguese language? Let's go with Roberto first, as you've got your thinking face on. I'm thinking because I'm not sure. Uh, we don't have many movies in Portuguese, like which is many Portuguese. But I think I would say Spanish, like La Casa de Papel. I really like this series. It's not a movie, but 
I really like the series of La Casa de Papel in Spanish. What does that translate to? I'm not familiar with that series at all. The House of Money, I think. Yeah, more or less, yeah. The more, yeah. <laughs> it's the, I think it's called The Heist on Netflix. I, I'm not sure how mm. it's called well, in English. The Money Heist, I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, finally, with you then, Mary, what's, uh, what's your favorite movie? But I'll let TV shows, why not? It's a Netflix generation after all. What's your favorite show in Spanish or yeah. Portuguese? To be honest, uh, I I don't watch a lot of series or movies. What? I Fair yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. I watch a lot uh, racing stuff and races not only from single seaters, a lot also from karting. I still watch. But if I have to say something, uh, it was a, a Spanish series. It's not a movie. That it's called Aida. That it's maybe funny uh, things and yeah, but. As, as I tell you, I, I don't watch a lot of uh, TV and series and this stuff, no. No, not. Your favourite things are 2012, Formula One, Spanish Grand Prix with uh, <laughs> Pastor Maldonado winning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, this is a special one. Uh, why don't, why let's, let's ask you then, Charlie, what's your favourite Spanish or Portuguese language movie? My favourite Spanish or Portuguese language movie, not my favorite tv show that's very much in english that has some spanish in it is called community that's pathetic mate come on there's barely any spanish in that if you ask me pan's labyrinth is a terrific spanish movie and uh that's an easy win you if you haven't watched it you should watch it it's fantastic you think white british charlie parker's cultured at all no uh, i'm not I, well you said it mate i didn't answer, ask i didn't answer that question but uh <laughs> I think that's a great point to leave it. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone. That's all the time we have for this week. Thank you for watching and listening. And if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, please use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping us a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And as you've seen, leaving your question, it will get asked. If you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.